Good morning. Welcome to the World Med School. My name is G.B. Migliori. I'm the director of the WHO Collaborating Center for TB and Lyme Diseases, Fondazione Mogeri, Clarate Italy, and Secretary General Elect of the European Respiratory Society. In this micro lecture, I'm going to discuss the difference between TB infection and TB disease in order to understand how TB transmission occurs and review critically the impact of MDR TB, HIV infection and immigration, and finally to familiarize with the available interventions. I'm starting here exactly from the point where Dr. Ravidiona left in this uh, global presentation where we have the global numbers. And I'll move then one step uh, towards epidemiology, <coughs> showing that we have four key steps that from exposure leads to the possible acquisition of flat TB infection, LTBI, that can lead to the development of infectious or non-infectious tuberculosis. For us, the infectious tuberculosis is the sputal smear positive case, and the negative uh, non-infectious is the sputal smear negative tuberculosis, and uh, unfortunately, it's also possible that uh, death is the outcome of the process. And risk factors are there to allow transmission movement from one step to another. Of course, in order to have to be exposed and to move from exposure to acquisition of latent infection, the intensity, intensity, frequency, and duration of contact are important. And of course, uh, other genetical factors or nutritional factors or comorbidities that might determine uh, the uh, acquisition of infection. That means that bacilli are hosted in the upper part of the lung at a dormant stage, just waiting to start replicating if any immunorepressive situation in this powerful of them is HIV infection AIDS, will then eventually be able to uh, determine the movement from the stage of infection to the stage of disease. We will further discuss about this. If you recall the slide on the global numbers, we'll, we see here uh, where the cases are. And we, it will be hard for us to recognize, as it is very slim in the slide, the United States, the Europe, where uh, we have low incidence of tuberculosis, why we have to look for cases where the cases are, in the fat Africa, in the in this sense, and the fat, the fat uh, uh, Far East, uh, and, and uh, uh, Indian subcontinent, where the majority of cases are presently are. Of course, we said we have up to 9 million, a bit less, active TB cases, but we, we have to consider this is just the peak of the iceberg, because the real important amount is uh, under the water and is represented by the people latently infected by mycotinium tuberculosis. So uh, the hidden epidemic, this to billion people or more or less, uh, we don't know exactly, it has been estimated to be one-third of the human population. Anyway, it's from this uh, pool of uh, rather than flatten individuals that future cases of tuberculosis will occur. Let's now discuss how transmission occurs. <clears throat> if you are in, in an island, uh, let's imagine to be in a hypothetical island in absence of intervention, so in a pre-antibiotic uh, and pre be controlled program era, then one source, uh, infectious source, is a positive case of tuberculosis will infect 10% per year, this is well demonstrated by uh, all the studies, uh, so it will infect 20 persons, uh, those 20 persons will have 10% risk of developing tuberculosis, so called breakdown rate, and half of them in being uh, HIV negative, more competent, will develop smear positive tuberculosis, so one source will produce one source, this is the reason why we have tuberculosis in the DNA of the um, mammoth's bones, and we have tuberculosis also in the uh, Egyptian mummies, and in a way we still have tuberculosis nowadays. But if we introduce treatment, the one source will produce just 10 infections, because the infectious period will be limited, let's say one year in the start. So the one source will produce half source, and uh, we saw here how just prescribing treatment is a very powerful uh, to, to reduce transmission within the population. 
but if you add early diagnosis, so the program is good and is able to diagnose early cases and treat them adequately as according to the principles of the strategy and management of the strategy to be controlled, then we further reduce the infectious period. We will determine five infections only, so the one source will produce one quarter of a source. And this is the maximum effect that the dot strategy can uh, achieve in absence of particular disturbing uh, situations or comorbidities or social determinants. This is what happened in Europe in terms of decline and the risk of the infection. The risk of the infection is the risk that a person, an individual is infected or infected by tuberculosis bacilli in a calendar year. And we see that in the pre-antibiotic era just improvement of socioeconomical conditions till the 40s produced a decline that was between 5 and 7 percent per year. This further increased up to 15 percent per year following the Second World War and bringing now the risk of infection to very low levels. If you look at the age-specific prevalence of the infection, that is the proportion of individuals that by age cohorts is infected by tubercle bacilli, so it's monthly positive, we see that in cohort born in 1920, my father was born in 1923, so we see that uh, in the AY axis, this is the prevalence of infection the proportion of monthly positive individuals. So it was born in 1920, at the age of 20 years, uh, almost 100% of them, almost all of them, uh, was monthly positive. And of course, those who were born uh, in subsequent cohorts, for example, those born in 1978, at the age of 20 years, uh, uh, in less than 10% of cases, were infected. And those born uh, after this, uh, in the 90s or even later, have a very low probability till adult age to be infected. In terms of mortality, uh, we see here the story of Germany. So there was a constant decline uh, for a few centuries, with a peak corresponding to the First World War, and if you project after 1940, the second peak corresponding to the Second World War. This because uh, there is a direct relationship between mortality and social economic factor in war, stress, malnutrition, and other um, uh, social economic conditions. Let's see what happens uh, as far as MDR is concerned. Let's imagine that we are providing irregular treatment. Irregular treatment can be considered here as either prescription of wrong regimens in terms of doses, choice of drugs, or duration, or poor quality drugs, or even, uh, and maybe most importantly, if there is lack of adherence. In this case, we increase the duration of infectious periods up to three years, so we will have 30 infected. So the one source will produce 1.5 sources. So we have here a double damage. First of all, we increase the number of TB cases, so we left the situation worse than we found it. And second, we have uh, no more drug susceptible strains, but drug resistance, or even multi drug resistance strains, and this is what should never happen. We should be able always to treat correctly a susceptible case and it's, let's say, moral duty to prevent that due to malpractice we develop uh, MDR tuberculosis. If you look in the slide here, in the top 13 settings with the highest prevalence of drug resistant tuberculosis are all from former Soviet Union countries with the world record uh, published uh, in Minsk, Belarus, uh, where 35.3 percent of new cases are MDR. This means that if you have three cases outside with tuberculosis coughing, at least one of them is affected by MDR to be strained. I remember I recall that the MDR strain is the one resistant to the to most powerful anti-tuberculosis isomazine and and unfortunately, the proportion of success, uh, that is the proportion of patients we can, let's say, cure or, uh, let's say, uh, ensure that uh, they the, the, the are sterile in terms of, of, of these bacteria, 
is uh, suboptimally low, so less than 50% in the different uh, W2 regions, as we see here, the green bars, while the proportion of tired in red, the treatment failures in black, and loss follow up in yellow and the unknown green represents an important part of half. So the combination of this situation makes the problem of MDR really serious. What about HIV? We said that HIV is a very powerful factor able to enhance the movement from a stage of infection to the stage of disease. And if on the right side the HIV negative has a probability of 5% for the first two years for less than 10% probability lifetime, it should be positive individuals have a risk that exceeds 10% per year and is more than 30 up to 50% uh, lifetime. So if, if you have even a good functioning program with a diagnosis and treatment, but we include HIV in the model, the one source will produce five infections, according to what we have seen, but due to the high breakdown rate, 50%, and the 40% probability becomes non-positive. It's less than 50 because you know that with less immunity, like, there is less probability to develop cavities and then to, to have uh, infectious TB, the one source will produce one source. This in absence of antiretroviral treatment. So the way to solve this, as Professor Harris will demonstrate uh, in another lecture, is to provide antiretrovirals in a way that uh, the infected individuals will behave as uh, infected ones in the community, and the answer to the treatment will be much higher. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the figure that I've been uh, shown by Dr. Leone shows that in sub Saharan Africa we have uh, up to 50% or even more HIV prevalence in HIV cases. And we see, for example, that the transmission of HIV infection is particularly rampant in from the Soviet Union countries. And we have here a graph. Uh, of a study from uh, Professor Frolova from the Russian Federation that shows the increase on HIV uh, cases in that setting. Uh, immigration is also a powerful uh, uh, um, risk factor for tuberculosis and uh, uh, for, for uh, poor, poor outcomes in a way. And we know that there are flows of uh, migration in different parts of the world, from India and some country to Europe, from Eastern Europe to Western Europe from Latin America, from Latin America, from um, uh, the Far East to uh, more North America. And uh, if you analyze um, TB reported in countries, in Sweden and Canada, for example, by birthplace, we see that in most cases, there is an increase of TB cases among those born abroad, and a progressive decline of the TB cases of those born in Switzerland and in Canada, and the two lines cross somewhere in the 90s, in the different year according to the country, but it happens in all countries. And if you analyze TB, this is the case of Switzerland, but this is the same in all of these countries, by country, uh, uh, by age groups, we see that we have a young peak of foreigners with TB uh, and an old uh, second peak of Swiss born, native born with older age. And when this group will go out for the system because of anagraphic region, reasons, then uh, the majority of cases will be with uh, immigrants. If you look to the UK, we see that London has an astonishing high number of notifications, much more than in other regions. And in Greater London, we have hotspots in that with the same incidence and prevalence of the countries where the patients are coming from. And this happens also in other uh, capitals. This is uh, a line representing the decline of tuberculosis and the history of interventions from isolation sanatoria, the use of dispensary, introduction of chemotorax 1907, introduction of drugs, BCG vaccination, and MR, the mass miniature X ray and then the introduction of that strategy and the modern approach, so outbreak management and regional management. The period of sanatorium is over, the period of screening is over now, we have drug treatment and still socioeconomical conditions driving the improvement. This is just to remind us that TB is a killing disease, this skull imposed on the X-ray reminds us how difficult it is and what we have to do for the sake of our patients. Thank you for hearing.